Hi, today we're going to be taking a look at the Pine Sill Soldier 9. So this is the version 2 Soldier 9, so this is the latest revision, slightly higher power, but this is a portable Soldier 9, very similar to the miniware that we looked at recently. The difference being that this is powered by the Pine 64 RISC processor. So this has quite a powerful processor running at uh, 108 megahertz. They've got the details on the website here with open source firmware. So you can develop your own firmware on here, but it does allow you to adjust things like the PID parameters and that kind of thing for this soldier iron. But um, in terms of soldering capabilities, I think this really comes down to the power delivery capability. And this one is capable of delivering potentially 88 watts into the soldier iron cartridge. Now, I think some of that depends a little bit on the cartridges themselves. We saw with the miniware, uh, even when it was running at 24 volts, we weren't able to actually get that 65 watts into any of the cartridges that I've got. So um, it comes with one cartridge and then I ordered the uh, high power cartridges to go with it. So this should give it the best chance of delivering the most amount of power possible. And we'll take a look at that shortly. This is the Soldier 9 up close and it's about 17 centimeters long so really quite compact. Again very similar to the TS-101 but the one thing to note is this is extremely lightweight. It's about 20 grams on its own and just over 30 grams with one of the cartridges installed. And the cartridge goes in this end here so you just slide it into the hole and just tighten up the screw very gently just to stop the cartridge from falling out just to keep it retained in there. On the front here, we've got an OLED, which is 0 0.69 inches in uh, across, sorry. So uh, a little bit smaller than the new TS-101. I think it's the same size as the original TS-100. And this one has, again, a two button interface to go through the menu and change some of the settings. So very similar in that respect. On this end, we've got a USB-C connector, as well as a DC barrel jack and the quick charge three compatible USB-C connector works all the way up to uh, I think it's 20 volts but then the DC jack on this model is capable of being powered from a 12 and 24 volt power supply. I think on the version 1 of this Soldier 9 it only accepted up to 21 volts. This version 2 allows a 24 volt supply to power it. So um, the other thing to mention on this one, this um, new version has a slightly higher output power capability so 88 watts and you do need that full 24 volt supply to be able to deliver 88 watts basically these soldering cartridges are resistive heating elements so to be able to put more power into these you need a higher voltage and 24 volts is the highest that this one supplies um, so that's the unit on its own um, it's got a nice little rubber grip and one thing that I noticed about the cartridge that came bundled with it which is this conical one here is uh, the overall length including the cartridge is quite reduced compared to the miniware so there is a reduced distance from where you hold it to where you're soldering but it seems to be only on this one cartridge now there's two sets of cartridges that you can buy for this soldering iron uh, perhaps the lower power series looks like this because I bought the the ones with the chunkier tips so that we can do some power tests with it but when you look at these they're exactly the same length as the miniware ones. So unfortunately, if you want these tips with the larger geometries, you're going to have to put it with that longer tip to uh, handpiece distance. But we've got a variety of tips here. This is the one that we'll use. Maybe we'll use this one on the 2P coin test, and we'll just see how these behave when we give it a proper test. So when we look at the little data sheet that comes with the soldier iron, you can see that it does have an accelerometer in the handpiece, so you can use that to set it to go to sleep and to wake it back up. Um, it automatically rotates the OLED as it did with the miniware, and then we've got a few details about it. So it supports power delivery, quick charge, as well as just plain DC power modes. So on the Pine Sill website, you can actually buy the Soldier 9 Direct. It's $25.99, but to get it in the UK, you end up paying about £50. And then you can buy some accessories to go with it. Um, I bought the gross Soldier 9 tip set, but they also do a slightly finer version. And what you can see here, actually, is that the ones in this set here are different to the one that was bundled with the Soldier 9. That length is quite a bit shorter than this one. You might be able to see it here a little bit closer. So we've got quite a short distance here where I'm using the mouse 
and then it's extended on these other tips so it looks like just this one that comes bundled with the soldering iron is that shorter length which is a much better design. Right so let's plug this into a quick charge 3 compatible power supply and it turns on and then we have um, the menus here so we can go through and have a look at the power settings first of all. So this first one is the minimum voltage so if you've connected this up to just some lithium batteries you can set the voltage at which you should shut off so it doesn't drain the batteries more than you want it to. Then you've got the quick charge voltage so this is the voltage that it will request from the quick charge compatible power supply and then we have the power delivery timeout. So that's everything in the power settings. Then we can go through to the soldering settings. So we've got the boost temperature. So if you temporarily need a boost of heat, something I don't necessarily disagree, uh, agree with, sorry, uh, but it's a way to overcome some of the thermal limitations of one of these soldering irons. It allows you to bump up the temperature temporarily and allow you to dump a lot of power into a solder joint. Then we've got the startup behavior. So this is whether the soldering iron should turn on uh, the heating element the moment it's supplied with power or whether it should wait for you to actually press the plus button to start heating it up. Um, and then we've got some set settings here which allows you to set the granularity of the up and down button when you're setting the temperature. Then we've got the sleep mode. So this is the sensitivity for the motion sensor, what temperature it should go to during sleep and how long it should take at least for it to get there. And then after 10 minutes in this example, it will shut down fully. Then some details about the user interface. So the temperature units, uh, the, te the display orientation, this is set to automatic. So if we flip it around, it should change by itself. Although maybe it needs to be out of the menu first of all. Uh, cool down flashing. So I think this basically flashes when it's uh, cooling down. Uh, the scrolling speed, so slow, medium or fast for how long it takes to scroll through here, which at the moment is quite slow as you can see. Uh, and then we can swap the plus and minus buttons around if you prefer it the other way around. You can speed up the animations and put the animations in a loop. The display brightness for the OLED. And this moves some of the numbers to the other side of the display. And then how long it displays the boot logo. Then just finally the advanced settings. So power limit. So if you have got a power supply that isn't capable of supplying 88 watts, then you can limit this in software. Uh, then we've got the option to restore factory settings. We've got temperature calibration as well as input voltage calibration. Now power pulse. This is if you have a battery bank that likes to see power being drawn continuously. This just gives a little blip of power at the interval um, in the next screen. So every four seconds here, for example, it will give a little blip of power and you can set the amount of power for each blip in that previous menu item. Uh, how long the pulse should be and that's it. Right, so let's try heating it up. So we're getting a peak of about 40 watts or so, a little bit less on the AC supply up the top here from my power meter. And it is climbing. It's a little bit slower than I would have expected. Um, and it's moving around quite a lot. But it was fairly quick to heat up. And just in general in open air it looks like it's drawing about 7 watts or so. So um, certainly heats up fairly quick. Let's have a look at the calibration and just see how uh, close it is to the number that it's displaying on the screen. So we're currently set to 330 degrees C. So let's try it on the tip calibrator. And it's probably about 14 degrees out. Let's increase the temperature up to 360. So again, it's looking like it's about 15 degrees out. So let's see if we can adjust the calibration on this. Right, so we go to advanced settings on here. Then we go to calibrate temperature. Now please ensure it's at room temperature, which it is. This is just um, cooled down. So we press the plus button and it does something here. 
and says 833. Then it says start tip temperature offset calibration. So I'm assuming we press plus here. And then it just goes back to start calibration. I guess we press plus. And it just seems to go back to this option here. And I've tried various different combinations of buttons. Try holding down plus. It just doesn't seem to do anything. So I don't know if the calibration function is broken. There's a bug in the firmware, but I can't seem to calibrate this tip. So we're just going to have to deal with the fact that it's 15 degrees out. And so to test this solder nine, we're going to be using a variety of PCBs that we've had manufactured at our sponsor for this video, JLC PCB. And as you know, you can get PCBs such as this one, 100 by 100 millimeters, made for just two dollars plus shipping. So a really excellent option if you want to get some low cost PCBs made for your prototypes. So don't forget to visit JLC PCB if you are thinking about getting some boards made. Now this board is first of all a through hole soldering PCB so this should be very simple for this soldering iron but um, it gives a quick indication of how good it is going to be at soldering. Now we did see the power delivery about 50 watts um, when we heated it up. Let's see how that translates into some actual real world soldering. This one's a trickier board. This is a high thermal capacity board. Now the limitation here appears to be the cartridge because it's not delivering power into the joint here. So no, this conical tip is terrible for this. It's not delivering any heat or any power into the joint. So let's try one of the different cartridges. No, we just can't get the power into the joint. Although the tip does appear to be making good thermal contact, it's almost like the thermocouple in the tip or the temperature sensor isn't well bonded to the tip itself. So you can see we're only delivering about 13 watts and it's just not melting or anything. So we've got a different one of our PCBs here. This is a high thermal capacity pad with the gold pads. And let's see how this behaves. So we'll get plenty of solder on the tip so it's making really good thermal contact. So you can see this is now surrounded, flooded by solder. But we're only delivering, as you can see up here, about 11 watts. 
and it's starting to struggle. It's slowing down on me quite heavily. Yeah, that's about as fast as I can move it through there. Now, the solder nine is still reading 350 degrees C. I'm just looking at the OLED now. So it's still saying 350, but it's clearly not at the tip. So it looks like the soldering cartridges are just not very well designed. Let's just quickly once again compare it with the Metcal and just see how different the power delivery is with that system. Right, so we've got the Metcal powered up. Let's see what happens when we put power into one of these pads. And you can just see the massive difference. It's just swallowing as much solder as I can feed into it. Huge amounts of power being delivered into the pad. It's saying 80 watts. Obviously there are a few inefficiencies, but yeah, a completely different story when you use a higher power station with better designed cartridges to deliver heat into one of these situations. So there we go, that's the Pinesil version 2 Soldier 9. And as we saw, the performance isn't that great. So it works fine for general purpose through hole soldering with the cartridge that came provided with it. But these other cartridges that I bought from the same supplier in the original Pinesil packaging, these cartridges just don't seem to perform. The first cartridge that we did the coin test with was a 2.4 millimeter um, chisel tip. And that should be able to deliver plenty of heat into any kind of solder joint and you saw even though it was surrounded by solder the power being delivered into it was only about 10 or 12 watts so really poor performance from that i think that's a problem with the cartridge uh, possibly with where the temperature sensor or thermocouple is located but it just doesn't have good bonding to the cartridge which is a bit of a problem really because uh, if there's no variety of tips available from any other supplier then this really limits how good this solder nine is ever going to be because there's only so much you can do with a fine conical tip. After that, you need beefier cartridges. Uh, this second cartridge, which is kind of a flat uh, cartridge, did a little bit better. Still not as good, I don't think, as even the uh, Miniware TS-101. So, um, yeah, that's my problem with this solder nine is just that these cartridges don't seem to be very good and you can't buy cartridges from anyone else. So you're really limited to just a bit of general purpose soldering and nothing too heavy. Having said that, the design is quite nice and there is quite a lot in terms of hackability. Uh, you can modify the firmware on this device, change the PID parameters and all that kind of stuff and it is extremely inexpensive. Um, so if you are looking for kind of a portable solder nine for occasional soldering, this one could do the trick and it's very nicely priced compared to the Miniware but the miniware just seems to work better. And then obviously a proper desktop soldering iron will do infinitely better than this at general purpose soldering tasks. So that's just my view. Let me know your thoughts and comments in the comments section down below. Big thank you to JLC PCB for sponsoring this video. And if you want to get some boards like this made, don't forget to visit them to get them manufactured. Big thank you to my Patreon supporters. And until next time, thanks for watching.